I encourage you as we, um, thanks as we as I talk, um, scroll back through these messages of gratitude and just like soak it in. It's so amazing. Um, so welcome to day two of the Accelerating Climate Capacity Engagement and Leadership Summit hosted by CLEAN. My name is Lindsay Kirkland. I'm the Climate Change Education Manager at Climate Generation. I'm calling it from my home in Vermont, which is on the traditional ancestral and contemporary lands of the um, Wabanaki and Abenaki lands. So Climate Generation, my organization is a nonprofit. We're based in Minneapolis. And we uh, hope to engage and inspire communities to take action on climate change solutions. And we sit on the Clean Leadership Board and we participated in the leadership team or the planning team for this summit. And we're honored to be with you all today and yesterday. Uh, the Excel Summit was created to provide an opportunity for you, members of CLEAN, and um, your partners in reality to come together in the same space to build deeper relationships and to foster collaborations for the coming year. We thank you for being here with us and taking your precious time to be here. And, and we're just, by being in the same space and, and taking time today, we're all acknowledging how much we value one another and value each other's partnerships and, um, and the ex expertise we get from one another. So I'm looking forward to being in conversation with you today. Yesterday, we were fortunate, I honored, let's say, to hear from Daniel Wildcat, who impressed upon us the importance of being in right relationship with one another and other human and non-human beings on the earth. Daniel encouraged us, encouraged us to reflect about what we bring to our work as leaders. And he specifically asked us, what do you embody in your work? And I encourage you today as you go through um, the reflective exercises that we have planned to think about that. What do you embody and what do you bring to your work? And Daniel's messages resonated with us as a group. As we moved throughout the day, themes of trust, responsibility, relationship building all percolated throughout all of our conversations. And I hope that they come up again today. Um, most of the day today will be spent reflecting and making sense of and making connections between the conversations we had yesterday. Um, there were so many great ideas thrown out, so many amazing um, work, to, work ideas and action plans. And today we just really wanna make sense of that, consolidate it and put it into a plan. And so you can find our agenda in the roadmap document that's been created. And I'm going to share that in the chat with you if someone hasn't yet already. So you should be able to open that. Um, you'll want to pull this document up today because there are some virtual tools that we're going to be using and they're all linked in this document. You'll see that we're gonna be using Jamboards for one of our breakout sessions. And that's gonna be specifically for you to document your conversations. So if you're joining by phone for that session, you're definitely going to want to join probably by a computer so that you can participate fully, or you might need to lean on someone else in your group to take notes for you. So the first breakout room, which I'm going to actually pull up the roadmap document so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, hopefully I can see that. Um, the first breakout room, which is called Discussions on Emerging Themes, um, Don Haas will be leading that or starting that breakout room, um, but actually all, all of you will be assigned to different breakout sessions and it will be completely random and there'll be no facilitator or note taker for your group. So what we're hoping is that when you get into your breakout room, you will generate a discussion based on the prompts that Don gives you and document your conversation using the Jamboard. And then when we go to breakout room two, or excuse me, like breakout, there's a lot of breakout, <laughs> how I'm referring to these breakouts now that I realize it, but our second um, series of breakout conversations starting later in the afternoon, um, this will be facilitated and there'll be note takers for you. So we just wanted to call your attention to that. If you have any questions about the agenda, I encourage you to put them in the chat now and some of our folks who are watching the chat can answer questions for you. And before we begin, and before I invite our first speaker up, I'd like to lead us through a breathing exercise uh, and review the grounding principles for our time together. So I'm going to stop screen sharing. And I've opted, opted to do a breathing exercise to help us bring our full attention to the space. So if we're to uphold what Daniel Wildcat um, suggests we do by 
embodying being in right relationship. It begins, I believe, by giving ourselves the time to become fully present, to calm ourselves and to set an intention for being together in space. So I'm for the next couple of minutes, we're just gonna do a quick breathing exercise together. And so if you're standing, you just ground your feet um, flat on the floor. And if you're sitting, ground your buttocks and your feet and uh, straighten your back. Place your hands on your desk or on your lap. Focus on a point on the floor or on your desk, or you can even close your eyes. And feel free if you want more privacy to turn your video off. We're gonna take a few minutes to focus on our breath. We're going to take three breaths, breathing in through the nose and out through our mouth at the count of eight. So we're gonna breathe in for a count of eight and then we'll breathe out for a count of eight. Breathe in. In and out. In again. In out. And one final time. And out. You can wiggle your fingers and wiggle your toes. Open your eyes. Thanks for taking that moment with me. I find it helpful to calm my mind and, and focus on my breath for a few minutes each day. Um, so now we're going to shift our attention to identifying how we want to be in this space together. Yesterday, Katie presented some grounding principles for us or community guidelines. And right now I'd like you or to provide you with time to read those again, but then also provide your feedback um, so that we can think about how we might change them based on our experience yesterday. So I'm going to reshare my screen and move into this slide. So I'll read these out loud for you. And as I read them, think about your experience yesterday and what were we able to uphold and what did we not meet? Um, what's important to keep for our conversations today and what might need to change? And I encourage you to add things to the chat, um, maybe share an experience that you had that might have gone better <laughs> or um, you know, add, add your thoughts, like what should we add to this? So we're in this space today to listen, to understand and not to critique one another. We're here to speak up, but also to step back and invite folks who may be quiet into the conversation. We want to speak from our own experience, don't speak for other people use I statements. And when you find yourself speaking on behalf of someone else, um, question why you're doing that. We recognize that everyone's voice matters in this space. We recognize that diversity is important and integral to our work and we respect everyone's opinions. We remember that we're all learning and we all also have something to contribute. And at times when we're talking about things, um, maybe especially some justice-based stuff, it's, we might feel vulnerable or called out, or maybe we don't know enough as w that we want to know. Um, and I encourage you to lean into that and give yourself grace. Again, we're all learning. We're all here to be uh, pushed into new spaces. And with that in mind, we wanna be open to new ways of doing things. We wanna have fun and be creative, create joy together. And we wanna put um, ourselves, bring ourselves to this work because the more we put into it, the more we'll get out of it. So reflecting on your experience yesterday, is there anything you want to add to this or change? You can put that in the chat. And I'll just uh, be quiet for just a few moments here, to see if anything comes through.
Katie, you did an amazing job setting these up. <laughs> Brittany says, um, I like to include assume good intentions. Yeah. So at Climate Generation, we use that guiding principle as well. Assume good intentions, especially when you're feeling um, that someone's caused you harm. You know, um, one addition onto this, Brittany, that I like to add is assume good intentions, but ask questions if you're not clear, right? You can always ask people questions, clarifying questions like, what did you mean by that? Or it hurt me when you said this, or I don't agree with that. Can you clarify? Yeah. Great. Nan says, focus on relationships. We're all relatives, not resources. Yeah, I love I love that. And many people commented on that. Um, what Daniel Wildcat reminded us or or maybe introduced to us for the first time, right? Is that sometimes we can fall into a trap of treating one another like resources. What can I get out of you? Being in transaction with one another rather than in relationship. Um, what can we do together? Maybe is a question we can ask ourselves. How can we uplift one another? How can we support one another? And how can we listen to each other? I like Jane's take joy in relationships. Yeah, relational work is really hard. It's actually hard to be present. It's hard to bring that emotional energy to work, especially like you might've heard my son. <laughs> um, I have a almost one year old son who demands a lot of emotional energy. And so bringing that to work is hard and give yourself self time and um, to find the joy in being in relation with one another. Yeah, be curious and ask questions. That's a great one. Love that. We have a lot, I think we have a lot of time to talk today and there's gonna be some really cool ideas that come up and just being curious about what people are thinking is a great way to like facilitate conversations. Great. I'm not gonna be able to add them to our slide because when I'm in presentation mode, it won't automatically update, but we'll definitely take um, a copy of the chat and add those. Thanks everyone. Okay, um, I have the honor of introducing our first speaker today, which um, I apologize if I don't pronounce your name right. I actually looked it up on Google of like how to pronounce the name. Um, Leon Zeitz, I, I think that's how you pronounce your last name. Leon has one of the most interesting titles or a previous title. I'm so excited to like read out your qualifications. It was so interesting to read your bio. So Leon is a global mental health and well-being expert working to make sure all people are supported with love and dignity. Leanne has worked with therapeutic programs for struggling youth in the US, particularly to identify pathways for them to play a greater role in their own care and the development of mental health programs. He's also worked internationally to increase access to community-based mental health services and historically, particularly in historically neglected youth populations. And he's worked alongside world leading experts to mobilize millions of dollars for mental health promotion and prevention. Leanne is currently the co-founder and director of programs at Climate Mental Health Network, and was previously the global director of love and compassion for Cities Rise. Uh, Leanne will be leading us through a reflection activity. And uh, with that, I think Leanne's already here, so I will pass it over. Awesome. Hi, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. Um, I'm just going to take a moment to get my uh, screen sharing sorted. Um, but thank you, Lindsay, for that opening session. I think it like sets a great tone for what we're about to explore together. Um, let me just see. Okay, share. Okay, um, can everyone see my screen? Yep. Okay, awesome. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I just hope wherever you are right now that you're in a comfortable place and that this session um, is additive and generative to what you've already been discussing. Um, from what I heard about yesterday and this emphasis on relationality and bringing our whole selves into the places we work and who we work with, I think mental health is really central to that kind of conversation um, as we all navigate, you know, a spectrum of challenges in our lives and support most people in our lives with whatever they're going through. And today's conversation is going to really focus on 
creating some shared language around climate change and mental health, and then also giving a lot of space for you as a group to speak with each other and reflect on your own experiences working at this kind of critical intersection, I would say. And so for today's presentation, we're first going to have a little bit of time for contemplative reflection, um, and that's going to look like a uh, an individual activity where you're going to get a bit of time to even just write and synthesize some of your own ideas for yourself. Um, and we'll do that first so that all the things that are simmering and brewing, even from the session that just went, can get kind of written down and that um, maybe people who don't like to talk as much can actually kind of put some of their ideas on paper. Um, there will be kind of sharing and learning at the end. In the middle, I'm going to give a presentation on climate change and mental health, just so we have a kind of a, a shared basis of language and knowledge. And then uh, also share a bit about what the Climate Mental Health Network's doing. And then lastly, we'll do a peer learning activity, which is really meant to enrich in everybody's experience through shared learning and um, yeah, kind of being in relations with each other, which I, which I think you're already doing so much of. And so to kick off, um, I wanted to introduce a contemplative reflection. And since we already did a bit of a breathing and grounding exercise, I hope people are present and what's going on in their days and lives has been able to simmer and you're able to kind of be here with us right now. And I just invite you to take a moment to reflect and write about your experience with climate emotions and mental health without any kind of coded presumptions from my presentation or any thought before it. Um, and, you know, this is an opportunity for you to write down any challenges you face with these topics within the settings or systems you work. Um, some guides that I just would in, include are just any curiosities or questions you may have about climate change and mental health, any places that you have emotional charges or experiences related to this issue. It could be childhood experiences or current connections to land or experience with climate related disasters. And then any sort of reflections and connections to other aspects of the summit. And then at the end, I just invite you to outline a practice you hope to continue to do that supports your mental wellness. And I'm gonna invite you to share what self-care practices that you write down with some of your other colleagues at the end of the session. So I, I, that, that's the one piece that I am gonna ask to share. And so I'm gonna actually just right now play some music and give everybody about five minutes to silently write or journal or respond to a few quick emails, whatever you really need to do. Um, but I, I, I just invite you to take this time that we don't often have to just sit and touch what your mental health experience related to climate change has been um, and, and, and use it in that way. So um, I can answer any questions in the chat if that's unclear. And I will be coming back on at 12.28, uh, so about five minutes from now.
to note, you won't be asked to share any of what you write for the step one question. And so, you know, if there's anything that hasn't necessarily come out of yourself or been written that, that you've been trying to put out into the world for yourself, um, this is just a nice moment to do so. And as we get to our last couple of minutes, I, if you haven't shifted already, I request that you document a few practices or activities that you do for your own self-care and wellness. These activities I will be asking you to share uh, with your colleagues later on. So um, it doesn't need to be an exhaustive, exhaustive list, but please note a few things that keep you well and healthy and feeling your full aliveness. about one more minute. Okay, after I do a short writing activity, I always like to just um, make sure that people who maybe got up get a check a second to come back if they hear my voice um, or if they were standing and writing. So um, if you did turn your video off and, and you're, you're back and present with us, please turn it back on. Oh, hi, Maureen. I, I, I'll, I'll be able to play the music at other points. I, I hope people didn't uh, easily rest into an early afternoon nap um, and get to reflect on your mental health. One thing I'll just say about this is that um, I always forget to articulate what's been going on for myself and get it on paper so that I can even have that reflective process of what was going on outside of my running brain and trying to piece everything together. And so just short activities for ourselves to just get things out on paper is um, so valuable. And I, and I hope you were able to use that. And if not, you know, you have the whole weekend to kind of continue. The next thing that I'm going to do is just kind of ground us in, in what is kind of this conversation around climate change and mental health and environmental education and what is the climate mental health network kind of doing in that space. And so the first thing I wanted to share with everybody is kind of an intense graphic, but if I could invite you to just uh, start your gaze at the top of the graphic, which says increased global temperatures and increased frequency and severity of extreme weather events. And so outside of necessarily the overall uh, politicized conversation of climate change, we are witnessing increasing global temperatures and the frequency of extreme weather events growing. And all of these things at like their pinnacle have a direct and immediate impact on people's mental health. Some of those impacts are direct and deep impacts and some of them are more indirect. 
And what we're seeing in society right now is kind of a lifting of both the direct and indirect impacts of climate change in a way that has never happened before. Um, I imagine in the settings and communities you work, and particularly with young people, um, conversations around climate change are likely happening more. And people's kind of angst and awareness around extreme weather events and, and climate-related cata catastrophe is also growing um, across the country. And the way in which we look at kind of the mental health issues related to climate change is uh, in a way like a cyclic um, compounding negative process in a way that people who are already dealing with mental health challenges climate change is a threat amplifier. So young people that maybe are predisposed to experiencing mental health challenges already, the added layer of climate change and extreme weather events creates additional risk for them that is cause for concern. There's also a lot of people that are having unique mental health challenges as a result of the climate crisis. And we'll talk a little bit more about those and, and they're being called solastalgia, climate grief and ego anxiety. Um, and these are kind of um, newer terms that are being applied to the unique effects of climate change's uh, impact on mental health. And I just say this to highlight that these are kind of complex intersecting issues that um, aren't squarely just about um, an individual's mental health, but it also translates to community mental health and institutional mental health. Um, and so not just kind of pinpointing it on the individual, but looking at all of these kind of mental health impacts across our systems. And next, I'm gonna just highlight that at the end of the day, climate change and mental health is an intersectional problem. Emerging research shows that 200 million people in the US are at risk for climate mental health issues. In a number of studies that are happening, but one in particular, we're seeing that Gen Zers in the U US are particularly worried about climate change and are having an increased fear of the future. 80% of people in the United States experienced extreme heat in 2021. And there's an, a plethora of studies that show a connection between extreme heat and mental ill health. Right now, we're seeing that in areas that have high susceptibility of extreme heat, um, people that have existing mental health conditions are struggling, but also there's higher risks of uh, suicide and decision-making fatigue that is just simply heat related. And so what we're seeing is that as heat and temperatures rise across the country, um, there's gonna be a coinciding mental health impact of that. And for everybody kind of working with young people and teachers, we're really seeing that as a kind of a pinnacle talking point because of the high risk related to extreme heat and, and poor mental health. And then lastly, young people and families with fewer resources experience compounded vulnerability. So um, not uh, to be exhaustive, but uh, communities that experience either racism and environmental segregation um, and large scale inequities across our country, they experience a heightened burden of mental health challenges because they are already living with a limited amount of mental health resources in their communities. And the overlay challenge of when there is a climate related problem, they're the last to get support and resources in that system. And so uh, when we look at climate change and mental health, I think it's always important to be asking like, how are the most vulnerable in our society impacted by these compounding issues? And how does everything we do center those voices and those challenges so that we can uplift everyone in doing so? Next, if you look at the right slide of the slate, a slide, I just wanted to introduce a few concepts related to climate change and mental health that are emerging. So the first is the term climate trauma, which is mental health, mental ill health caused by the negative impacts of climate change. Climate trauma can be both an acute experience or an ongoing um, state of fragility and fear um, and trauma response that happens in like continuous extreme weather. So nostalgia is the distress caused by environmental change. It's a new term in kind of the psychiatric and psychological community, but it is useful in uh, articulating the unique type of distress 
caused by the environmental changes we're seeing. Climate grief is the process of how we mourn a changing world. And I think all of us in some degree or form experience a grieving when uh, we see land loss or um, animal populations going extinct, um, or just like the neighborhood that we grew up in changing. But we as a society do not manage grief very well. And the lack of grief management can lead to further mental health challenges down the line. And so having conversations and spaces to grieve in healthy and supportive ways is really important. And then lastly, climate anxiety, which is the psychological nervousness and despair related to uh, the climate crisis. Um, this we're seeing a lot um, as young people um, witness kind of how systems are slow to respond to the existential threat of climate change. And climate anxiety is increasingly kind of a, a language that's used to describe people's angst in the, in the face of the climate emergency. This is all overlaid with a mental health crisis amongst young people taking place in our country. Um, we know that young people are struggling disproportionately during the pandemic. As this picture states, the Surgeon General raised the bell around young people's mental health and well being. And at the Climate Mental Health Network, we firmly believe that mental health needs to be integrated across all facets of the education continuum, and that teachers also need to be supported and educators need to be supported with tools that tend to their mental health and well-being, either through internal support and the systems providing pathways for self-care. And what this means to me and how I look at this is that we have an opportunity to address climate change and mental health issues simultaneously, and then increase the progress that we make on both areas. Importantly, climate justice and racial justice are centered in both mental health and climate change. And so I just invite everybody who's approaching these topics to honor and center that Black, Indigenous, and people of color and queer communities in the United States who also experience a range of disproportionate impacts have less access to re resources to address the health consequences of systemic environmental racism and disaster. And so when we're talking about these issues and educating about these issues, it's important to center that un overlaying the broader issue is a history of systemic environmental racism that plays out in current and past disasters. And often when I work with young people, this is an important lens that they won't want to ensure centered when they're speaking with people discussing climate change and mental health. So how is the Climate Mental Health Network responding to these range of issues? I'm not going to give an overly detailed presentation, but I did want to share with you how we built ourselves. We, we started last year, and uh, my co-founder, Sarah Newman, uh, and CEO is also on the call, um, to be a public health response to the climate mental health crisis and to ensure that we're integrating mental health best practice and knowledge into the systems that need it and to the people that need it most. One of the ways that we built ourselves is through having a Gen Z advisory board. So there's 10 young Gen Z activists that help inform our work and a series of national expert advisors that kind of work behind us and inform everything we do. The first area of programming that we're building out is in K through 12 education. And it's right now focused on building resources for diverse educators who are doing environmental education work to integrate mental health principles, social emotional learning, and contemplative self care into the work that they do so that when they're navigating the complex emotions that come about with the climate crisis, they're equipped with the tools to tend to the students' needs and their own needs through that process. Um, and so right now we're doing a series, focus, a series of focus groups with teachers nationally to build out curriculum ready interventions that can complement already existing lesson plans and work and provide tools like contemplative reflection and self-care for teachers to use outside of the classroom. Um, and so that work has really come out of listening to a range of educators saying that these issues are coming up and they're needing support in navigating that. The second area of programming is peer programs. We know that it's 
a community-based issue to address climate change and mental health. And that in talking to like-minded peers and community members about these issues um, and actively collaborating on potential solutions, that people can have the dual benefit of taking action on climate and gaining positive mental health from social connection, peer support, um, and being vulnerable with others about their challenges. The third area of programming that we're working on is storytelling and events. And this is really to raise the conversation on climate mental health within diverse circles. And we're doing that through generating media and working with our Gen Z advisors to build kind of um, relevant content for young people. And we're also convening various groups like educators and scientists and young people uh, to center this issue of climate change and mental health. Lastly, before we get into our own group sharing activity, this is an art um, from Kunso et al. in the Lancet 2020. They stated, recognizing that emotions are often what leads people to act, it is possible that feelings of ecological, ecological anxiety and grief, although uncomfortable, are in fact the crucible through which humanity must pass to harness the energy and conviction that are needed for the life-saving changes now required. Many of the young people I work with, they feel and wholeheartedly embody this conviction to embark on the life-saving life changes now required. And I think the systems that they operate in, particularly schools and extracurricular activities and their families, um, increasingly are going to start to embody this shared conviction to address these issues. Um, and that's actually a profound moment for humanity to start reconciling the existential threat we face. Um, and so I think one of the um, hopes that I have is that by entering a more relational space, by being more attuned with who we are and how we're doing, we can actually have more meaningful conversations on climate change and support each other in the process. And so with that, now I'm going to invite all of you to actually start um, learning and sharing with each other. What we're about to do is we're going to break you up into groups of three or four. Once you're in a group, the first thing that you're going to be invited to do is select a note taker and a timekeeper. Once done, I'm inviting each member of the group to go around and introduce themselves and answer the following questions. What self-care practices did you write down in the first activity? What key challenges or questions are you up against related to climate mental health? And what is one hope you have for mental health and environmental education? After that, I'm gonna message the group and invite everybody to shift the conversation to what's working. Share any best practices currently used in your workplace that touch on the intersection of environmental education and staff and student mental wellness. At the end, you're gonna create a shared goal or shared goals for addressing mental health and environmental education. You will then ask the note taker to prepare the response and share it back in the chat. If time feels limited, I am gonna skip the create a shared goal, but if you get through the conversation and you're looking for something to do, I invite you to create a shared goal with each other. We're gonna then consolidate all of this information and share it back in the chat with the clean team. And the result will be a set of best practices that you all use to care for yourselves, a set of challenges and questions that the group has, and then potentially what's actually working right now in your settings to address these dual issues. Um, so for, and I'll have time at the end of my presentation for um, some quick chatter, but since we're running, um, tight on time. I'm going to break everybody up into the groups of three or four. I'm going to then share this process in the chat again so that everybody can have these directions. And maybe I'll take, is there anybody who's totally unclear and wants to ask a question right now uh, before we break you up? Okay. I'm going to pl place, I'm going to stop my share right now. And then I'm going to share the directions in the chat for everybody.
And then Gina, if you and your team can help me start to break everybody up into groups, that would be great. Yep. Um, Haley, how is that um, working for you? Yep, breakout rooms are ready to go when you're ready. All right, okay. um, if everybody wants to just, oh, I'll, I'll reshare the activity directions again, but why don't we break them all up into groups? All right, breakout rooms are opening now. Hi, Alicia, good to see you here. Um, if you're still in this room and haven't uh, joined a group, please let us know. I see Haley, uh, Saida, Randy, and Alicia. Um, if, if you're not there, I'm totally fine too. Yeah, some people might not be. Oh, Haley, sorry. Um, I know you, you've been helping. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm the tech person, so just, yeah. it doesn't sort me automatically. <laughs> and it looks like there are, everyone has at least two people, a few people I, who haven't joined. So hopefully I, that's good. And some people are joining back right now. Maybe put me back into my room. I wasn't, I wasn't hearing the other people. So I thought I'd jump uh, out yeah. and coming back in. Okay. Thanks, Ingrid. Definitely. Ingrid, you back in. All right, Ingrid, you should have just been assigned to a room. Lynn, I see you're back. Um, and I'll assign you to a room. You should get another invitation. Just in case people come back. Um, Haley, do you know if I send a message in the chat, like, will everybody able to be able to see it? Or do you think everybody was able to open the activity directions? I hope so, because if you send a message in the chat, it won't go to everyone. I can send a message. Actually, I think you're a co-host. So you should be able to send a message. Yeah, okay. So I'll, yeah. The thing that says broadcast message to all, so you might be, and then it says message all rooms on this pop-up window. Yeah, I mean, I would assume if I, I would assume people like are able to still click it in their chat. Um, but right. all or they would be That's coming true. back. It right. It should be in their it should be in their chat history. You're right. OK. It doesn't look like you can send um, files. Um, uh, Gina, one of the things I wanted to yeah. ask is that uh -huh. in, in a few minutes, um, mm -hmm. Could you like pop into various rooms and just see if they need any help and that they're actually talking? Um, yes. And then I just wanted to note that I'm a little bit behind time. Is that okay? Okay. Um, yeah, let me just pull up the roadmap. Like it's going to go like two, maybe two to three minutes over. Oh, that's totally fine. We were like 15 minutes late yesterday. So, um, yeah, Katie, Katie's right after you. So we'll I'll just tell her that we're gonna be a couple minutes late and she can make okay, hers a cool. little faster. Yeah, no worries. If it's just if it's a couple of minutes, it's not a big deal at all. Um okay, I'm gonna start hopping then so I can make sure people are chatting.
to know that there are things we can do and resources out there and that we can lean on each other and think about, you know, what helps um, others do their self-care. And I will just mention that I actually we have a little kitty doing self-care in my lab right now, so I apologize as I try to manage her and um, <laughs> uh, doing the next session here. So, um, right? Am I uh, am I right, Gina? It's it's on me next. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. I the cat. I couldn't quite get to all my documents. <laughs> Moving into day one questions. Yes, we are going to be talking about reflections from day one. So let me share my screen and the cat is gone. So that's great. Awesome. Here we go. All right. Can you all see my slides now? Whoops, not share. Let's press that. Yes. Great. All right. So uh, we just wanted to take a moment to think about yesterday and um, this will help set us up for the next breakout discussion because um, <clears throat> the next breakout discussion Don will lead us through and we're going to be focusing on kind of what emerged um, from all our discussions yesterday and what's missing from that. So um, we at the end of the day yesterday we did um, a reflection through Mentimeter and y'all um, had some really nice responses. So this was the word cloud that came out of um, highlights from the day. And you can see relationships being the biggest um, the biggest thing that, that people really established yesterday, which is nice to see. We talked a lot about that yesterday. Um, networking and connections, um, feeling community, feeling connected, feeling hopeful. Um, and then a lot of uh, topics that came up for people too, including, you know, justice and um, uh, symbiosis and um, listening, um, connecting with people, youth action, uh, game games, using games. Um, and then I think also we felt energized and inspired um, and found the conversations interesting um, yesterday. So that's really nice. Um, and I think really ties in with a lot of the themes um, that we keep talking about. Um, there were some challenges, uh, a lot of people, not enough time, lack of time, um, and feeling energized and exhausted. Funding, funding is always a big issue, right? Um, and um, this is what we're trying to, oopsies, do today is, is help people make connections so that they don't have to reinvent the wheel, that they can find what other people are doing and what's working. Um, and so I don't wanna go through all these because we went through these yesterday, but I just wanted to pull out the few things that I saw kind of over and over. Um, <clears throat> connections, um, inclusiveness, uh, funding, again. <laughs> so that was a big one. <clears throat> Collaborations, networking, um, listening, sharing, reflecting. Um, and then the things we're looking forward to today, which um, I think, again, really just get at these themes that are coming out, um, including networking, learning, listening, collaborations, connecting, right? So all this idea of, of working with others, partnerships, um, this is really nice that that's kind of the focus of today. So these are the themes coming out and then we're gonna move towards um, these focuses in our next breakout discussions too. Um, but I also wanted to just take a moment um, so those are the things we're looking forward to, but what are the topical things that are coming up for people too? Systemic change, taking action, um, advancing solutions, uh, collective systemic work, sharing resources and job opportunities, the adult education and cross-disciplinary, those came up quite a bit as well. And then, um, <clears throat> These were some themes and big ideas that Lindsay, thank you, Lindsay, went through um, a lot of the notes yesterday. And <clears throat> these were the things she saw coming out of the breakout discussions from the first round of breakout discussions where we were talking about our work and the big topical areas. Um, so building genuine and authentic relationships and community. Um, and this, some, some sub themes that went along with this were building trust and how do we build trust, uh, using art to build community. I know that's a big topic in clean often. Um, the responsibilities that we have, uh, Daniel Wildcott 
Kat talked about this, our rights, but also what are our responsibilities? Um, and then building authentic relationships in our culture. So some people talked about how difficult it is, you know, in the sort of um, westernized and Americanized, fast paced um, culture that we live in. How do we take the time to stop and build those authentic relationships? Um, and then um, identifying and problem solving around resources and how, how we do this work. Um, we, we keep coming back to it. Funding is such a major issue um, in the work that we do. How do we find the funding? How do we match the funding to uh, projects that need it? Um, and, you know, how do we get more funding for this work because it's so important and sometimes not always seen as um, or valued as much as other work, even scientific work. Um, how do we reach broad goals with small projects? A lot of times the funding only provides enough for us to do these small scale projects, um, but how do we reach these larger goals of climate adaptation and mitigation and you know the big sustainable development um, ideas with these sm smaller projects? Um, understanding and leveraging the power of networks so people are really seeing the value of making these connections and having networks like clean um, to gain access um, to resources to others to ideas um, to have support support for the work that we do having a space to come and talk about um, ideas and or just finding people who understand and can listen to what you're going through um, professional learning communities um, and we talk about clean too similarly as a community of practice um, and these groups you know that really provide learning spaces and connections but also as I mentioned that support um, how do we bridge informal and formal education spaces? And then the other importance of networks is um, learning from others and gaining that information about how somebody else is doing something that's working, um, not just reinventing the wheel, you know, providing those success stories. Um, and then another big, big topic that came up a lot yesterday was reaching across silos. How do we, you know, as climate education folks, um, in a broad sense, we do a lot of work across a lot of different areas and fields, but how do we branch out even more and connect with others? You know, um, for example, people doing workforce development, you know, how do you find the other, other, you know, groups, the businesses, the workforce, people themselves, um, but you also have to maintain that bridge with the, the education side of things and understanding how people learn and how to help them develop. Um, or, you know, uh, community engagement folks, how do you find the community members? How do you connect with them? You know, how, how do we bridge this idea of the formal and the informal education that came up before too? Um, you know, but these just different silos we live in, um, or, you know, my work, we work with a scientific research institution. So trying to help scientists who are doing a lot of climate work, you know, bridge um, with people who want to understand that or, or just reach, you know, and communicate um, with the with the world really. So um, this idea of like that we all kind of live in our silos and we work in certain areas, but how do we kind of branch out from that? Um, and then some other themes that didn't quite fit into the above, though, but came up quite a bit is the intersections between education, policy, and workforce. Again, similar to what I was just talking about, um, there's a lot of intersections here. A lot of what we do is just this is why, you know, education is defined so broadly because we have um, <clears throat> this so many different parts of it. There's the formal education that a lot of people think about, but there's just so much more than that, you know, and we've talked about um, New Jersey and California and Washington, some of these places that are actually working on the policy side to, in, to engage the education side. Um, workforce development is both education and um, working <clears throat> in workforce. Sorry, my um, I still lingering cold symptoms, so I apologize um, about my speaking here. Um, and then adult education was another one that kept coming up over and over. Um, and the idea of intergenerational work. So a lot of people here work with youth too. And so how do we bridge um, the work with adults and work with youth? So those are the themes and the ideas that we saw coming up. Um, and I kind of wanted to present those, but then I wanted to give us a little bit of time here too, to let folks um, 
how, what do you think about these? What uh, stands out to you from these themes? And what do you see that maybe didn't, didn't show up in what we saw as a big theme from yesterday? And we'll have time, as I mentioned, the next breakout is all about what emerged and what is missing. Um, but the, so this is just to like help us seed that conversation if there's something that we missed um, in, our, in our analysis of yesterday. I'm doing my teacher pause. Oh, put the last slide back up. Yes, I can definitely do that. I wanted to allow for folks to see each other, but yes, a good point. I can also come out of the slide and copy these into the chat if that's helpful. Wonderful. Well, um, I'll put these in the chat, give it another minute here. We have a little bit more in this session too. Frank's gonna talk a, a bit too. So if we don't um, have anything else to add at the moment, then we can move, move on. I'll give it another minute or so though, in case folks want to jump in. I just wanna amplify the, the point about, oh, here. Um, amplify the point about feeling this mismatch between the scale of the challenge and of our projects. And um, connecting with this community um, helps me to, to um, see the, the um, broad reach of the work. But, um, you know, I, I wake up every morning thinking, how do we grow this? How do we grow this? Yeah, really good point. Christy, you have your hand raised. Yeah, as I was listening and then looking at the slide, I was also thinking that something that we maybe didn't talk about yesterday and now that um, I think is really important is uh, is doing needs assessments for the people with, with whom we work and educate because their needs could be very, very different. You know, the needs of someone in Boston would be very different than the needs of someone in, in rural Alaska. Yeah, really good point, Ginger. Um, I I really liked the the hub um, connector thingies that I can't remember who used those in the presentation yesterday, but I think that that is a helpful thing for us to be able to witness. And I think, I can't remember, maybe on the clean website, there is a map of where everybody's located, but um, I, the, I, to me, those seeing those linkages or those commonalities helps deal with what Nan was saying about, you know, I'm only this person doing this here and I feel so insignificant, but then if I can see that, that chart and that web and, and just be reminded, I'm not the only one, there are other people doing stuff and you know, we're all doing our best. I think that's that's what gives me hope is knowing that you guys are out there. Great, yeah, thank you. That's a really good point. Um, and Maureen put in the chat, more diversity of participants. Yes, love it. Um, any other thoughts? We'll give one more minute here. And then Frank, is that be enough time for you? Absolutely. Eric. Thanks, Katie. I just was thinking about, you know, since Don is about to lead us up, you know, his virtual pubs that he runs, I think these um, public forums to talk about this are a real interdisciplinary opportunity to raise awareness, even among folks that maybe it's not at the top of their list. So something to think about. Yeah. I'll throw in the climate cafe concept 
where you just give people an opportunity. That's that's somewhat similar to what Don was doing as well. Um, but it actually lets community pe people chat with each other about different things that they might do together. But it's not at the top of their list either. Yeah. Real quickly, just to add, um, I think since we're all, you know, the statistics about experiencing extreme heat, right, we're all experiencing that. So regardless of why that's happening, it might be a nice entry point because it is experiential and, and it could be a, a just unpacking that with folks that, and maybe sometimes it's just not understanding, you know, weather and climate systems or having a reason behind why they don't want to connect it to climate. but. But maybe allowing that to just be, but saying, hey, we're all experiencing this heat issue. How are we navigating that? And then softly, there might be an entry point to have a conversation about weather and how that relates to climate and, and that kind of thing. But just sort of that experiential piece and the listening stance first, as opposed to sort of the judgmental, it's climate change driving this. We got, you know what I mean? So it's like, allow these diverse opinions to just present themselves and then and then maybe it's a vehicle for having deeper conversation. Yeah. And um, Nan put in the chat supporting youth leadership too, which I think is really important and really integral to a lot of people's work here too. Any other thoughts? And again, you'll have lots of time to discuss this as well. All right, Frank, are you ready? Oh yeah, no, don't don't go to the next slide, please. Ah, okay. go back, hide it, hide Sorry. it. Sorry, Sorry. So, no, no, it's okay, I know what you're doing, but uh, um, I wanna, I want you all to appreciate something. Um, in the 14 years, the Clean Network has been active. Um, we've never done what we're doing right now. So there was a bit of a, uh, you know, is there a net down there? Are we gonna slip off the, the um, you know, the tightrope? Um, and so far, it's, it's, uh, we're working. What I'm about to show you represents a piece of us, and it is already impressive. So go to the next slide. So the survey that you did, um, my assistant Haley Krim and I and Katie, who made the survey, have been working behind the scenes to take that information and try and put it into a matrix that came from something that some of us were part of back in 2010. Um, and we modified the, the matrix, but you, your self-reported information, and we started putting it into the matrix against project type on the top and audience on the side. And the intersection of those two is where we placed your project. On the top of the roadmap, you have access to the, uh, the Google Sheet that this is a, a screen grab from. So if you're having a hard, I see some heads are moving in closer to the screen like this because you're trying to read what those are. I don't recommend that's the solution. I recommend using the roadmap to go to the Google Sheet. That way you can really explore that. But the other thing you can do when you look at that is you can actually go to a second tab which tells you what these codes mean. I know Billy Spitzer, his data is one. So one B is, is his second project, one C is his third project. So you can start seeing some patterns here. So our analysis with Bart, uh, who is going to be the one leading this session after the one Don is doing, I think it's important that you start seeing where there are clusters. And are, are the colors beyond the, the background colors is our attempt to show you, we see some patterns here. Blue means this is, we're surprised we don't see this yet. That's all it means. It doesn't, and that's, a lot of that is coming from, we only have the people we have. There are so many other people in this space that are actually very active in a lot of these spaces that if we were able to do this again, and we're having, uh, this is an idea that showed up this morning, 
how would we get more people to contribute to this? Because I think, um, Ginger, your point about I knowing a lot of other people, or Nan, your point, knowing other people are engaged in the space actually alleviates a lot of what Liam was talking about this morning. Because I know I'm not alone. Well, let me show you, you're not alone. But now you have data and information to work with new people. That's really what this day two is about. How do we get to work, collaborations, alignments? Um, and so each of these colors, as you go into Don's session, just think about, you may not agree with our groupings. You may wanna do different things, um, but this is a way of you seeing that community engagement is a strong area. K-12 students, that's that green bar, is a strong area with lots of different project types. Network development and community building, oh boy. I'm glad we added this, this, uh, this column because it is a robust strategy for a lot of audiences, but some of them are not active that we know of, or they are, they're just not here. So it just gives you a sense of what's going on. Clearly career and technical education is not present today or that data hasn't come in yet, but um, we know that's active, but they're not here and their relationship to what we do is really important. Um, and so the last one uh, I'll call out is the informal education space, that red bar. There's, there's definitely activity in the informal but given what I've seen recently out in the wider community, there's a lot more density of work in that, on that red bar than is present today that we've seen the data or, or from or who is present. So this, this opens up so much possibility and opportunity that is um, really, I, I wanna honor that because it is, um, it's special. And it's unique, and it's also uh, affirming to um, really what is possible. So um, anyway, this is very colorful. Um, you know, uh, so there's a lot going on here, but you have access to this, so you can actually carefully investigate. Um, and if you take anything out of today, is that the attend the matrix, the SL attendees tab on the spreadsheet? has all the people, has their emails, has what they're doing or are about to do. I hope you find that is um, very full of possibilities. Uh, even if it doesn't happen in these conversations and some of these two uh, projects next to each other, um, even if the two people who were in community um, as an audience working on curriculum, 40, oh, that's the same people, sorry, well, that's not gonna work for my example, but um, K-12 pre-service teachers curriculum. So that's, uh, that's 15B and 17B, whoever they are, you, you now have the opportunity to know about each other and possibly collaborate. And there might be more people that we don't know who that's a very important audience to work on that project type. So any clarifying points? I think we have a few minutes um, here. Now would be a fine time as we go into the next session. If you have any clarifying points, we've been staring at this a lot for quite some time. Come on. All right, Laura, there, there you go. Oh, it's like there's been some questions in the chat too. Oh, I'm sorry. I will look over there. <laughs> I've been I've been very but yeah, Laura, Laura, please go ahead and then I can try to help with the questions from the chat. Thanks, Katie. I can't hear you, Laura. You're still muted, Laura. Uh, Katie, Katie, why don't you go oh, to the question? Oh, yeah, while... I, uh, I can ask her to unmute. I apologize. I think we've um, tried to mute people during these bigger sessions. Laura, can you no, unmute I want now? to make 
I want to make sure I've got the um, number and letter thing correct. Sure. So the number is the slide, the participant slide number. No, no, no. Okay. No, that's not right, Laura. The, okay. the number, so if you go to the, the Google Sheet, you're going to see um, the matrix is one slide, one tab, and the second tab has all the information. The number is the person. The letter is the project that they, you could submit up to five projects. So Billy Spitzer was the first person to complete the survey. Thank you, Billy. Um, and so 1A is Billy's first project. 1B is Billy's second project and so on. So the number is just as we got the data and went through it, um, number is person, letter is their, their project. Okay, great. So it's not anything to do with the slides. I have to look at both the tabs together to be able to there read it. There you go. You got right. it. Yeah, so we did the numbers based on when people responded to the survey, but um, and they did the slides separately from that, so we couldn't quite coordinate those, but most likely a lot of the same, same projects will be represented in both. Like for me, I did the exact same three projects on my slide yep. as I did in my survey, and I bet a lot of other people are very similar. The one thing we pulled from the slides over, but did it in the sheet was Haley brought the emails over from the slides if they were there so that at least that information is together. So there is some connection between the slide work and the second tab of the matrix. Emails so, uh, actually aren't in yet, but they will be in this afternoon. <laughs> All right, Haley, thank you. They will be there soon. <laughs> and Haley, I think I saw you're also building a legend um, tab for the colors and stuff. This is still a document we've been working on the last few days. So it is all still happening. But yes, I think we're adding legends. A lot of people have been asking about like what the colors mean. Um, legends are in there, the numbers, et cetera. Uh, there, there was one other question that I wanted to get to. Um, Oh, Leon, um, is there a way to self-populate from the forum so it can be a living resource? I would love that, but I don't know how to do that. This is actually something that, you know, with people filling out, um, I mean, you could with a Google form instead of a Qualtrics survey, possibly have it go straight into a spreadsheet. But Haley's done a lot of interpreting because some people don't fit into the categories here and stuff. And so Haley's also taking, you know, what people say in the comments of about their projects and kind of interpreting them into here. So it'd be pretty hard to populate even with a Google form, I think. But anyways, so, Christy had a question too. So just a quick uh, spanch on your point, uh, Katie. Absolutely. I think the Google, for, do. I, I mean, Leon, you're, you're, you're going exactly where I am thinking is that this is a beginning. Um, this is not the end of this process. This is an experiment. I think it is a astounding success, dripping with possibility and importance. So, but there are other important projects, people, initiatives that are not represented here. So bringing that across in some process, but I still think knowing the way Haley's had to do this, that there's still a human being between the Google form or whatever form is completed and the populating. Not, be, but if we wanted to let people, one thing we were unclear about is is sometimes our interpretation might not be, you know, two C might not be in all the right places. So we, you know, there's this is the well after the summit we will have to think about this a little bit. But I think there is there's more work here that is um, has to happen, and so I appreciate that point very much. Did I miss anything else in the to follow up on that, Frank, you know, you mentioned that you, there are lots of projects that aren't listed. Uh, and I know that we work with many other projects that I couldn't represent in the survey without talking to the people involved in those projects. So yep. what is the process then moving forward? so that we can gather this information and, and people can know what it is used for um, sure. and know to whom it is um, shared. Because certainly one thing that would be an, a potential issue if this is shared super broadly is that you know our funders don't have their recognition <laughs> and that's important to add to a spreadsheet like this as well. So Christy, uh, I think we are going to, after this, a small group of us are going to have to figure out exactly what you just said, um, get it right, put all the right considerations into it, 
Um, and I don't see us being able to not expand this. I'm, I'm deeply interested in committing to figuring out how to deepen this, um, but do it right. So, um, but you know, that, that's, a, that's a beyond the summit. At this point in time, if you, and I did see some people, maybe your data isn't in here. If it's not, complete the survey um, and, uh, or add more. Um, and uh, we'll try and get that in, uh, you know, as soon as we can. Uh, it won't happen right now, uh, but uh, I think you get the potential of what's, what's coming in here. So hopefully that's enough to set you up. Laura, I see your hand is up again. Yeah, so where is this document going to live and how will we have access to it? And then if we access it, how can we make sure we don't mess it up <laughs> when we're putting so, something in? Uh, you can't actually put anything in. Uh, you can comment. We made it so no one can change this other than, than the organizers. But you can comment on it. Um, and the roadmap for this event is, is live. So um, you have access to the roadmap, thereby you have access to this document. Um, if, I if I download this document into my Google Drive, will it yeah. continue to change as you all change it? I believe it so. Should, I mean, if you don't um, make a copy of it, if you add like a, a, right. a shortcut to it, then yes, you'll be shortcutted to this document and it will keep changing as we change it. And just for those who aren't sure, on the roadmap, this is listed in the middle column, second down as Excel's matrix. And then the survey link that's attached to that is that. Yep. And I just want to I just want to make sure we do get to break and people have some really great comments and thoughts and ideas about this. And I just wanted to point out that we are going to come back to this this afternoon. This is going to like we're going to use this to really set up the final breakout discussion and we can talk even more about it. And I'd love to hear your ideas of how to expand this and what to keep doing with it and how we can leverage this data as somebody in the chat pointed out. Um, but I just wanna make sure we do have time for a break before we go into our breakout discussions. Um, Frank, anyone else? Um, any last thoughts, comments? No, I mean, I just see one point that, that there are gonna be people doing more survey work to go into this. So after the summit, we will continue to do this and we'll communicate with you as we update this, you'll see it in the spreadsheet, but they also will communicate that we've got more data. We'll put it back in and see if these patterns um, start changing, but also the, the attendees information will expand as well. So thank you all. Yeah. And actually, this is great. Um, somebody just put in the chat, Christy just put in the chat, like maybe this would be good to put out to larger you know, set of people, we could definitely talk about putting this out to the clean network. And yeah, let's keep talking about that this afternoon. So, and let's make sure we get a full 10 minute break. Um, so let's actually come back at 1150 Mountain Time or 150 Eastern Time or wherever you're at. <laughs> uh, sorry, yeah, the, the 10 minutes to the hour, 10 minutes before the hour, we will come back. We'll actually take a 12 minute break and we'll just start our next session a little like five minutes late. So Thanks everybody. And we'll keep working on this. And, and yeah, I'm really excited about all of the information and um, conversations that we've been having. Um, during the, during the break there. Um, so we are moving into our last um, portion of the day here. Um, I appreciate everyone hanging out for so long and um, uh, sticking with us on a Friday afternoon. Um, so, Kate, I don't know if you have any other thoughts before I hand it over to Bart, um, but Bart is going to lead us in our next session here. Yeah, we did want to just review the community agreements before the next breakout, but I think Bart wanted to do that before we actually go into the rooms. Do you want to set us up first, Bart, or do you want me to do that first? Yeah, I mean, I think if you have it queued up, you can go ahead and do that right now. Um, that's that's fine. And then I don't I don't have it queued up, but I can bring and it. Then up. I'll go. You can get it queued up because <laughs> I don't have it queued up. Uh, that'd yeah, cool. that'd be great. Why don't you start us off, and then I will queue it up, and then we can do it right before the discussion. Um, wonderful. Hey, so yeah, just to echo Katie and Gina, thank you very much for hanging in there with us um, throughout this whole day. And uh, it was great hearing the conversation coming out of those breakouts. 
that um, you know, there's this interest in kind of, all right, what are we gonna do? What's next? And that's really what this session is about. It's about trying to look for those opportunities for collaborations and actually try and name those collaborations and name some commitments, both like commitments of what we can do with each other um, and maybe some commitments of like how we can take some of the, the work of and the kind of learning through this uh, cells to, to inform our practice and where we are. So really quick before I get started, um, I'm Bart Merrick. I work for the NOAA Chesapeake Bay office and, um, and kind of work closely with Frank and others uh, having to just do some thinking around this is Cell Summit, and uh, really psyched to be here, and thankful that I can help out a little. Um, so, so uh, you know, I think it was Katie uh, that showed us this map um, when we got started here uh, yesterday. Just kind of like encompassing the look that the clean team took around the community that has engaged in this work and the connections that exist amongst that community. And those might be some relationships; they might be looser. Um, they might be more active collaborations, but the thing is, there's an opportunity to kind of grow that network and grow the kind of density of the collaborations that might exist there. And as we go into this session, I don't know how many people have seen some of these books, but some of these things are really influencing um, some of our work in the Chesapeake Bay region and you know, me personally. And um, so, uh, but, but they all point towards like what Sarah kind of left us off the last session with, and that is that kind of thinking that um, we need to kind of work uh, to change the systems and networks are a powerful tool for doing that. They take time, um, it's a long time, it often involves a lot of relationship building, but networks have the power to address challenges, be nimble and not be kind of like stuck in a, in a system that perpetuates some of the challenges we have been working with. That's, that's the potential of a network and I, I think, um, having that network mindset as we go into this next session might be helpful. And really like that, that mindset is really just a way of looking at the world uh, and to see it relationally. You know, just like Daniel Wildcat said, just looking at our relationships to each other, our relationships to um, the, the spaces and the environment around us. And if we can do that, there's that potential to scale impact and, and focus on kind of that end goal or that end vision, which in this case, like maybe it's, around kind of climate engagement, climate literacy. We haven't really defined what that vision is, but it's, it's towards an end game. Um, and it's about helping us scale impact towards that end game, not necessarily growing an organization or particular function, right? Um, it's about being part of that interconnected system and, and not necessarily the center of it. Like I, I don't, there's a lot of nodes in that, in that clean map. And the idea is like, how can we kind of spread out some of that network stuff maybe? And then sharing that leadership, sharing that power, sharing that credit when things do go well and when we have that opportunity and then fundamentally building those relationships, building that trust-based relationship is, is key to that and not just perpetuating these systems of control. So this network mindset, I'm hoping are just things that maybe can live in the background as we progress to our next, um, next piece. And, and I wanna like encourage people to think of themselves a little bit uh, uh, like a heretic. And a friend of mine, Corinne Wildminster, who was also like doing a lot of stuff in climate space, kind of brought this forward and told a really nice story about um, like herself in school being labeled a heretic. And uh, it resonated with me because I went to, uh, went to a Franciscan high school, so St. Francis and uh, just outside Buffalo down. And um, Father Justin was giving us a religion class and was saying, hey, if you don't believe in Jesus and God, you're gonna go to hell. And in the middle of the class, I went up and I was like, hey, what about Gandhi? He seems like a great guy. I'm sure I would meet him if there's a heaven. And he's like, dude, that's, that's heretical. You can't say that, which was interesting and kind of set some pathways on me. But the point is like, even kind of questioning like what's the function of this, uh, this meeting here too? Like that's really important, right? Cause it's, it's, it's uh, we're trying to dig in and have that kind of constructive dialogue. So feel free to be that heretic um, because what we do want to avoid is that same old thinking, the same old results, and that kind of wrapping ourselves around on that hamster wheel um, time and time again, which many of us have been on and continue to be on. Um, so I think what we're going for here and what we're trying to encourage is a little bit of um, some quick thinking, some uh, rapid co uh, like coordination and collaboration opportunities that'll hopefully support the idea of some divergence um, in terms of like what's out there 
maybe trying to find some ideas that resonate with us that we can act on and that convergence and then using our heretical being or hop off the hamster wheel to try and come up with something that's emergent, something that's a little different and maybe a new way of thinking. So push yourselves maybe in new directions, challenge each other, think to the best of your ability in, in the time that we have allowed to kind of support that magical quality that really has the potential. And this is why we work in networks to, to have that, um, that creative element that kind of makes the exponential power of the impact uh, more possible. Um, so uh, I know folks were geeking out about this matrix. Uh, I was geeking out about it as well. And uh, I have to admit that like one of the things that I was geeking out about was like, hey, this is gonna help us make up some groups um, uh, that we might be able to go into here this afternoon, or at least name some spaces that we might be able to focus collaboration based on where we saw some concentration of, um, of people and programs that were mentioned. So that's, that's what we did. Um, that's one of the ways that we've already used that matrix. And you heard Frank mention that earlier. And so we're about to go into uh, a kind of final round of breakouts. And we've named those breakouts based on that matrix. And, and you can kind of see what they are here. And so I'll leave this up here for a minute um, and just kind of note that, you know, we are going to self-select into these groups based on what you're most interested in. Um, but we just named them based on where there was concentrations. And then the idea is within those groups, um, oh, sorry, one note is, um, we have, we have a couple of community engagement ones and we kind of have a combined one too. So the deal is you'll be able to kind of come and go from the breakout. So if there's nobody in like the combined case of 16 community engagement one, we might be able to pop out and go to one of the ones, the other engagement ones. So just know that there's that flexibility built in. Um, and a couple of- And there's open the open rooms. Yeah. And in case uh, like something is not resonating with you and you wanted to suggest something that can be popped into that open collaboration room. So there will be facilitators in each one of these rooms to help guide the conversation, um, kind of share the, um, you know, the, uh, the guiding questions that we have put in. There was a question in the chat, Bart, about what the difference is between four and six. Can you talk to that on the last slide yeah. before you move? Yeah, so, um, so the community and civic engagement is really about how do we um, support learners to try and orient themselves to um, like civic action, kind of stuff, and like engaging in policy spaces and things like that. So that more activist type thing. Six is really more about kind of like what we're doing here, really working in a space or an area or region geography to try and develop a network that builds community and relations amongst people. Does that make sense? Um, keep bringing those questions and thank you for calling that out. I appreciate it. Um, and so here's, here's the ask. Uh, Choose your breakout, go where your heart is, um, go where your desires are. And then in each breakout, um, the, the ask is to do that divergent thinking. So what are some key collaborative actions that this group might want to name or advance uh, over the next six months? Or you could also think about like, what are you planning to do this next year, fiscal year 2023 or you know, this fall and winter? Um, just to put that stuff on the table really quickly. Um, and then, Consider IDing one that might seem to be, or, or two that it might be a good thing to focus on. And that's that convergence piece, right? Just land on something and then discuss um, some of the conditions for emerging, that emerging thinking, like how might clean support the network? What else uh, or who else might need to be part of this group to move it forward at some point? Um, what are the collaborative networks that were, or groups that are here might be important to evolve? And, and maybe even like some of the groups that are chatting in those other rooms, who's important to connect to? Um, and then just do some thinking, if you can, about what progress can be made in, in six months. Now, I know we don't have tons of time, but the ask is just do this thinking in a group, see how far you can get. And then the hope is once we get back in uh, to, to community here in the big group, we can, um, we can just learn like, what is, what is that action or that priority that you think is important to focus on? Um, who might be supporting that work? It'd be actually good to sort of name the team that might be there. and then. Who's the point person that is willing to kind of just at least maybe set up another meeting, provide that kind of initial lighter touch back growing support. But the idea is to try and see if there is some capacity here to advance some of these actions, some of these ideas um, in, in kind of a shared way. Um, so uh, that's what, so when we get back, that's what we'll ask is just kind of, what are the actions, who's involved? And then uh, what are the next steps that you might wanna be um, engaging? 
Uh, so I think that is the synopsis of what we have. And I think I might have gone a minute too long. Um, and Bart, can I just really quick share? I have it up now. I just want to reshare our community agreements. Um, <clears throat> you know, this is the this last conversation we have, and as Brett said, it's, it's going fast, right? So I just wanted to kind of um, make sure everybody understands that, you know, um, especially that we're, we're, we're listening as well as speaking here, um, using our own experiences, um, you know, trying to respect everybody's uh, voice and, and recognize others' opinions. Um, and especially if you're somebody who talks a lot, try to step back a little, let others um, join the conversation. If you don't talk a lot, step up um, and just make sure that everybody gets a chance to be heard. Um, and, you know, we're all learning um, and being open. This is especially a time to be creative and open to new ways of doing things. Um, and hopefully what we put in will um, be what we get out of this as well. And I know there were some more that came in the chat earlier today. I'll put those in the chat again, um, which, which were really great, but I did not write down quite yet. Um, so I just want to remind everybody to please be, you know, inclusive of all the folks in your, in your groups um, when we're having these conversations. Cool. Thanks, so Bart. I think um, Haley was uh, setting up those breakout rooms and naming them, and we'll just mm -hmm. uh, give people a minute to get into those breakout yeah, rooms. Yeah, Bart. Before they go into the breakout rooms, um, the the questions from your slide. Do you think you could put those into the chat? Oh yeah, I totally can. Sorry, and they're also in that facilitators thing as well. Yeah, they should be in um, the for folks you know from the roadmap. There are the the discussion notes, documents, the questions are in there as well. They're also in the um, roadmap itself. Great, thanks Bart. It just helps when it goes with them to the breakouts through the chat. So Absolutely. I think Haley said Absolutely. the breakouts are ready, is that true? And in this case, people are choosing their own breakouts, right? Yes, yep. yes. please. So there we go, they're open and all of the facilitators should have been invited to join their room and then you can just choose. And let me know if you're having any issues choosing. You should see a blue join button. You can just click next to the one that you want. You can always come back to the main room, join another one anytime. I'm sorry, where are they accessible from? So if you look at the bottom of your screen where there's like chat, participants, that kind of stuff, there's a, a one that says breakout rooms. So mm -hmm. yeah, thanks. So you click on breakout room. Um, and it'll open a thing with these blue buttons. You can press join. Got it. Thank you. And, and it might say more for some people if you have a smaller. Ah, uh, yeah. You might have to open the three dots on the side. And who might be on that next? This meeting is being recorded. And so uh, maybe we can start at the bottom, though, as opposed to like, Start with group number one. Maybe if we started with group number eight, I don't think there was anybody in the open collaboration ones. Um, so, uh, did somebody from group eight want to chime in? Group eight being workforce career. Oh, I'm sorry. Group eight was visitors to informal oh, centers. Visitors, thank you. I missed one. I am sorry. I've got it up in front of me. You all probably don't. So, yeah, that's that one. <laughs> Christy, do you want to do it? Because you did such a great job taking notes. I figure maybe it's sort of in your head from taking the notes. Sure. Okay. Thank you. So um, we just defined that we, we certainly need education to action, um, specifically related to groups who are outside the classroom. And one thing we pointed out is that when we go to the clean list server network to look for all the clean resources right right away it says something you can use in your classroom at the top and this is the space for um, informal settings and one of the common themes we discussed on are some of these outreach modes uh, and models 
for informal science centers and, and outreach and education um, that is really having people see themselves as being part of the solution. So they get to actually experience being part of this solution, either through stories or simulations or systems thinking. And then we realized that um, people need the capacity to be able to do that. And there are networks that CLEAN could highlight in this regard uh, and best practices that they could highlight and examples. So lots of examples of where it's community-based, community-led education and outreach that's not necessarily in a museum, but could connect and be a partnership with. Um, so we thought that it'd be really important to have insights into climate advocacy groups. And, you know, there are other networks like CLEAN, like the Climate Adaptation Science Exchange and the Climate Adaptation Science Centers. So getting what they're doing to network to these, um, to these informal education, outreach and museum settings is really useful with lots of examples that where people see, oh, I can do that too. Mm -hmm. I hope I synthesized that. Um, Ingrid and Maureen, if you wanted to add anything, feel free. Yeah, well, I mean, if you reach for the stars, you know, it would, it would be it would be nice to have like a, even like somehow a, a sharing network to to get advice, because especially when you're in the informal setting, there's it's often kind of um, volunteer and scrabble and, you know, put together. So um yeah i don't know if there's a way I, i'm just thinking thinking out loud as you were as you were talking Kristen. um yeah it would just be interesting if somehow with the clean that if somebody were looking for advice or like how how you know something that, that would be nice if, if, if within that network if there's like a an info sharing or something um interactively among that would be great but just a a thought All right, um, and uh, I don't know, um, Christy or Maureen or anybody else in that group, did you, like, is anybody else on point to try and advance any of that uh, at this time or that you want to name or it's kind of like still, and it's okay if not, it's just because we all realize we're capacity limited, but is the, is the, if the next step is to kind of provide that we space. Also, we also recognize that people are at a different place in being and knowing about clean in the first place. So it's, it's hard yeah. to know how you can advance something if you're, you know, here for the first time or occasionally, or, you know, and, and what I see personally is, gosh, if I went to go search the clean databases, does it speak to informal educators and out education outreach? So how do we maybe tweak a word or two and also really get those conversations, those side conversations happening? Well, yeah. Awesome that we have the clean team on this call, right? <laughs> yeah. We can think about that too, Mike. Yeah. I, I don't mind that. helping out a little bit. I guess I can, you know, whatever is put me on a list somewhere. So. Yeah, I'm taking some. I mean, I know you all took notes. I'm taking some notes just so you're aware of things specific to the clean side of things that we can do. And I will also throw out there that, like, you know, the network side of things that, um, you know, highlighting things in the resource database and changing language and all that like that is stuff obviously that we would work with you all on and I just also want to highlight that if there are things that um, come out of this conversation other groups um, you know that um, that are more network based or more or, or other things that you want to do with like the calls and stuff like that that that's also something that groups can do on their own, you know, obviously stuff on the website we have to do, but there's also a lot that can be done from you all as well. So um, there's going to be a little bit of back and forth probably. And yeah, like I'm taking some notes and like Christy, that's a great idea. And um, Christy and Maureen and your group, we can reconnect about some of the language and other things on the website. I, we've been trying to do that the last few years, trying to make it a little more um, accessible and inclusive of informal education as well and outreach. And I would love ideas for continuing work. Thank you. And that's actually, uh, 
it's actually a handy transition to the workforce group too. And I don't know if Kelly or um, who wanted to kind of share the summation of what that conversation was like and what um, you're all thinking about advancing. Um, Kelly nominated me to say a few words about what we talked about and- uh, John, um, thank you. Sure, uh, and, and anyone else who was in that group can feel free to chime in. Um, we uh, um, we started with um, folks who were really not experts in workforce development. So um, that's uh, an indication of a problem with the meeting we have today and, and who all's here and figuring out how to uh, um, uh, how to address that gap in the matrix and gap in the group, I think. Um, uh, but uh, um, we did end up talking, we, we had a very good conversation about creating communities of practice uh, for workforce development and um, uh, figuring out how to reach across from other areas into workforce development, most conspicuously, I think, from science education. Um, we also talked about a few examples of different projects that work and we can see our notes in, on page 16, I think it is, of the, uh, um, of the document. Uh, we ended, or uh, very near the end anyway, talked about um, each group member committing to reach out to five other folks uh, to grow the community of practice. Another important issue that we talked about was not only how to um, nurture the growth of a network, but how to make sure it's sustained over time, which I think is a, a really important um, issue. You may get some grant money that lasts um, three years. And I talked about the example of the Western New York Environmental Alliance, which um, started maybe 12 years ago or so and went great guns for a few years until the funding ran out to support it. And then it, still goes on in some form, but it is not um, the vibrant community that it was briefly. And, and that also has to do with uh, sort of one, ins one local institution kind of pushing its way in there that I think put off some uh, members of the uh, organization, which has involved over 100 uh, environmental organizations in Western New York, but, uh, but most of those are sort of minimally participating now. So um, uh, what else do other folks from that group want to add to what I've said there? I'll, I'll just offer that I like I, I sat in on that group and I think the intent was to, to get convene the folks that were part of that group in the next month or so. And I think mm -hmm. Frank and Haley, did you all agree to kind of make sure that convening happens? Cool. Done. Um, so just in the interest of time, um, Don and whatever, like I'm gonna hopefully kind of go up to the, the group number six, which is the network development and community building one. And I'll just say like, just keep time in your mind so um, so we can share effectively, but not um, keep people here too long. Yeah, some different- Hi, this people. is uh, Tamara Ledley. I'm going to be the spokesperson for this group. I will be brief. Our overarching conversation um, the kind of high level themes came out were um, to uh, the, the need for regional networks, which focus on the local um, climate change is also most impactful and relevant at the local level, but also thinking in terms of starting at the scale we want to be and then digging down into what it is we need to do to, to, to reach that scale. The specific actions, and so basically we shared um, what each of us really thought in terms of about a uh, where we needed to move the network, how, how to build networks. And we came out with a number of different members of this group um, connected in terms of, so the next steps. So um, Billy Spitzer and, and Seth Spencer are going to talk about how to scale the professional development model of climate generation to another level. There'll be a conversation between David Kay and Seth Spencer around uh, connecting the work that they both do. Um, another idea was around, and this actually comes from early on in the clinic, is, is having those regional 
regional networks or regional clean networks. And so it's something that the clean network as an overarching body could help facilitate. There was some experimentation because I was the one that led that for Clean New England way back when. Um, we did end up with a website, but didn't go any further. Um, it was also going to be conversations between Billy Spitzer, myself, and Jane Hines Fry about a professional teacher professional learning community on these topics in the context of the various networks that they're part of. And then a couple of other groups also talked about, a couple of other individuals talked about connecting about their work. So this is start of building the networks, but that overarching piece was, was really, was the, the, I guess the largest piece was building those regional networks that get to focus, like the clean network does, but gets to focus on regional context. Anybody else from the group can weigh in if I've missed anything. I think that because we were talking about what are the similarities, the best practices that all of us could use, but making it to where it had applied to the regions that are going to be facing similar climate impacts, especially mm -hmm. in the regional sense. The power of those network of networks is, is that each region has different local focus, but when the overarching clean network can see that there should could be connections that can be made, they can facilitate that exchange. Yeah. Yep. So the strong communications between networks is the, right. one of the key outcomes. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Um, all right, awesome. Thank you, uh, network group. I, was folks that were in the combined K-16 and community engagement on, was that a, that group happened? It sure did. Hi, I'm All right. I'll try to represent, and in the interest of time, I don't want to shortchange our rich discussion. Our notes are there. But for the yeah. broader group at this, this hour, I'd like to say that we made some specific suggestions of how CLEAN could help in this area. We focused on discussing um, the challenges and opportunities and success stories that people are having with uh, students of all ages reaching out into the communities and having impact and the value of when students get an opportunity to work both with their elders and then with students younger than themselves, whether that be just an, a junior classman or even elementary students and the power of that. And uh, one of the interesting asks for CLEAN was that we see students working in little pockets, sometimes maybe only one, two, five, maybe as many 10 students at one institution, but what could clean, magnify and connect these students much the same way they're doing with all of us by creating opportunities for uh, people involved to connect groups of students with like interests, like activities or, or synergistic activities because uh, these students might feel more empowered, more connected, and, and grow their networks earlier and faster if CLEAN could facilitate that. So I think that was one of the big takeaways. That's, oh, that's, that's uh, I think connecting these student groups and these civic action groups, like that makes a lot of sense and it's definitely empowering, I think. Um, thank you. Wendy, um, how about the, the, the broader or kind of the community civic engagement one, the more advocacy oriented? Group five or four, sorry. Anybody from there? Yeah, sorry, that's me. I was like brainstorming about what I'm gonna say. <laughs> oh, thanks, Angie. Ah, everyone's doing so well, eloquently explaining their group discussion. I'm feeling pressure. Um, so I'm the representative of our group and our group ended up talking very specifically about policy. Um, I think we are focused really heavily on civic engagement. So I had almost nothing to contribute, which was great because I got to hear and be inspired by everyone in my group. Um, so I think what we ended up focusing on was in alignment with other folks are talking about. So Tamara and the network group talking about like a regional or a very local approach, but also having it be scalable to have impact. Um, and also I think one of the group, um, maybe eight, talking about making sure we know who's in the network and who's not and, and like figuring out those blind spots. So I think what we came down to was um, one of the best ways to improve civic action is to support organizations that are already doing work to be better policy, like drivers of civic action through a policy um, framework or through a communications framework. And so we talked a lot about 
creating toolkits. So one being um, a toolkit and a tra an accompanying training on how to do a press release. I think we've seen these from other networks, but um, just giving the, the quick and short, like how an organization highlights their work to, to media because oftentimes like local newspapers wanna know about this, but you don't have a direct connection. And so figuring out how to establish a framework and a model that um, other organizations can use to do that work. We also talked about supporting and facilitating connections between organizations doing the work and organizations doing policy stuff like in organizing youth climate justice summits or connecting to youth advisory councils. Um, also thinking about producing models for approaching school boards to get really um, involved in like teaching school board members about climate change, about climate change education, and then helping them advocate for change. Um, so try not to go too much longer here, but one of the things that we see in clean is like we have a disparate group of folks who all have great expertise in their respective areas and we're all limited in capacity and so thinking about how do we connect non-policy folks to policy folks right like at my organization we have one policy person and they just don't have enough capacity to understand climate policy and education policy and climate education policy so we really need to partner with an organization that can help build out our knowledge and help us figure out how do we incorporate policy. So um, clean could be a really great place for that. Um, also, you know, one of, the, one of the things we talked about was connecting with organizations like the National League of Women's Voters or um, other organizations that have climate platforms to figure out who's writing that for them, how can we be involved in that and leverage their range of network um, to really figure out you know, that connection to policy and civic action that they're using that we can leverage too. Um, okay, uh, let me see here. So one thing we identified is that no one has capacity to do the work that needs to be done, especially from a policy perspective, because it's vast and varied. <laughs> uh, so of course, we're gonna need like a community of practice or a committee to even establish some um, frameworks for starting this work and identifying people who could lead it. Um, and no one in our group was really ready to take that on yet. Yeah, totally fair. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, but definitely an area to work. And I love that school board part too, like that direct to schools advocacy that is. Um, yeah, like Climate Generation has a school board advocacy toolkit, a school board resolutions toolkit that like helps youth or, or adults go to a school board, but we don't have anything that's like, specifically, if you are on a school board, this is how you advocate for climate action, you know? So that I thought was really interesting. That was Nancy's idea. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, so just in the interest of time, maybe we can go to that group three, the K to 16 formal education and, and civic engagement group. Yeah, I'll, I'll kick us off um, with just some framing and then I think the group might have some just real quick popcorn in high level kind of things that they took away. Uh, but one before all that, just a synthesizing thing for the last two days for the team might be, you know, we talk about climate education um, in terms of we should we don't lead enough with solutions. We always leave with gloom and doom. So maybe the next clean, you know, iteration of this gathering could be very project focused based on the matrix. You know, now we have these identified projects. We can sort of hone in our work together at a, at a subsequent conference. So just a, a thought, but not coming out of our group. From our group, um, and I just want to say I'm really excited that there was international presence today. I've been in groups with a, a gentleman from Brazil, a gentleman from Ghana. Uh, in my last group, Rory was from France. So I think that was a question I left personally with was, is Excels and Can Clean support international work? Because the storytelling behind recognizing that this is a global phenomena with local impacts is really powerful, but to support that work is really challenging because of the funding constraints if you're going international and even the logistics of, of doing a Zoom with somebody that's 12 hours difference, right? Or, or, or what have you. So. Um, I just, we sort of leave, left that as a framing question, um, but because we were international, I th that just kind of came to mind. Uh, and then the group, uh, we've talked a lot about uh, teachers and resources, and I'm going to let the group popcorn in some of the high-level stuff real quick, and I know we have, we're short on time. So, Rory, you had some thoughts initially, so maybe I'll call on you if you're on the call. 
Well, Brittany also, <laughs> I, I just very quickly say that I, I, I was saying that a network would have to be very, not only diversity, but, but also a background, different stakeholder. It would be stakeholder network with, with business, uh, uh, policy, labor, uh, community groups, consumer groups. Uh, they would have to be all sharing the goal. This is the network would, would share the goal of climate action and would feed into formal education. So for example, one example I, I shared with Eric later was uh, uh, that this young lady at the conference on climate, uh, clean energy with her steel company that she's set up, which produces low carbon steel. She was, she sounded great at the conference. She should be on a network teaching, informing and formal education. So, um, and they would become ambassadors, advocates, and educators. So each member of the network would, would wear several hats actually. Yeah. I think that's like multiple stakeholders coming in to like helps amplify some things too. I think that's, that's an interesting perspective here too. And I, I'm just gonna move us along because I am sensitive to time. So really Eric, quick. okay, yeah. Can I say one really quick one? Just as, as that excels is, is definitely pulling together real collaborations, doing really practical work. Um, an example would be, I think we're very, very helpful in things, working with Brittany and the Mass Audubon, as in Massachusetts Audubon, I'm taking a look, we're looking at the youth program there. I think we have a really good match for connecting with our students in DC and California and Maryland. So I think youth action connecting up across the states, just we're doing it. No, thank you, Jim. And thank you for chiming in too, I appreciate that. Um, so uh, how about the group two, that K-12 group? Mind chiming in quickly? Okay, I'll try to keep this pretty brief. And Margaret, Randy, Anna, and Sarah, please let me know if I missed anything big. But I think, you know, we really talked about the need for these subgroups, uh, shared interest groups, so that we can really meet with people who are trying to work in the same arena. Um, and but that these are not just one off events, that these are ongoing meetings that maybe happen quarterly. Um, so some of the you know, topics are around maybe elementary education or modeling and gaming as it relates to climate education and learning and action. Um, and so again, there, that, that there is just this, you know, it's again, not a one-off, it's something that could happen over time. But then also we could be using sort of an AGU model. This was actually something that Randy brought up for people to be able to propose their own groups or sessions so that you, if you have enough people, <laughs> you can get together with your group um, and host and organize these meetings. Yep, <laughs> I see thumbs up from Frank. Um, and, and, but that also people could join later, that these are not closed groups, but that there is of course the opportunity to grow, but there is a designated leader and there are new ways to bring people in and have a roadmap. And um, Sarah and Anna were talking about graphic facilitation as a way to really be able to bring people in effectively and, and have common goals and um, effective meetings. Um, so then the other really big thing that we talked about was about how do we get to the, the people in education who really affect the structural components of our education system, the people who write the standards, the people who are the state science supervisors, the superintendents, the principals, that often these are the levels of communication that we're missing in terms of how we're working at the you know, teacher or county office level. Um, and then with the people who are actually doing the development of the programming around climate education, that we need more coherence across all of those levels. And I'm seeing that in California, that we don't have that level of communication all the time in the types of programs and the work that we're doing around curriculum development. Um, and because we need that teacher buy-in and we need that, you know, regional and county office level and, and district level buy-in um, for all of this to happen. And then we, we actually talked a lot about social science integration and that that may be a really important um, next step in curriculum development that I know, again, I, you know, there are lots of people working on that front already, but how do we organize around that? So anything that I missed, sorry, that was not as quick as I had hoped. <laughs> okay. That's okay, you did a wonderful job though. Like I heard definitely some key points and thank you. So I think those communications with the right people that are making decisions seems super important. Those affinity proposing topics is kind of an interesting model too. So thank you. Um, and uh, so how about group number one, K to 12 educators, folks working in the professional development space. 
Hi, so um, we talked a lot about different ideas to bring professional development in at different levels. So I'll let you guys peruse the diverging piece on your own. We converged on the idea of some kind of multidisciplinary um, professional development and also training for pre-service and, and teachers currently in the classroom. And the um, major actions that we'd like to highlight is we think that um, you know integrating climate literacy and justice into into teacher professional development and preparation across all subject areas and grade levels. Um, and we we propose doing this by creating a kind of coalition, uh, finding a point person potentially through clean who could do the the legwork, calling the meetings, setting agendas, tracking progress. Um, that coalition would include interested parties who would be willing to identify objectives, assign tasks, and set the due dates for action. We'd all like to be a part of that coalition. Um, we had um, myself, Danell Hogan, uh, Sarah Johnson, and Rick Reynolds, all a part of the group. Um, but we all agree that um, th there needs to be some source of funding for this that needs to be identified. Wow, Carrie, very succinct. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> but I mean, so I know like this was short, right? And it was very compacted, but still an opportunity to engage with maybe some like current people working in these similar spaces. And I heard some great ideas come forward that um, between the groups that maybe met, those ideas there in the clean network might be able to advance some of these down the road. So hopeful and again like what brings people to a network what brings people to a community is the conversations the development of relationships and the ability to kind of collaborate to actually do some work so it's nice to see that that's being pointed towards so i'm gonna um pass it off to <laughs> thanks Katie, for yes. gina to wrap us up Gina's going to wrap us up. I just wanted to jump in and say thank you all. We are at time. We're running 10 minutes over, though. Gina wants to do a little bit of closing here. Please stay if you can. I understand if you need to leave. But I, before you leave, I wanted to thank Gina. Like She has put this all together, and it's been amazing. And I'm really looking forward. There were some great conversations at the end here, and I'm sorry we're kind of wrapping up so quickly. We'll continue these conversations in the Clean Network. We'll send some emails out about next steps. I love the ideas of some of these groups, and I'm hoping we can have some folks um, who are willing to step up and coordinate some of these groups, you know, um, so that we can actually have meetings and move some of this work forward on like the regional hubs and, and thoughts about how we can organize those through clean. And then some of the other work, I'm hoping you all sounds like you're all gonna connect on that as well. And I put some notes down on what like the clean team can do. Um, so we will move forward with a lot of this and keep talking about it. And um, big thank you to Gina. Please close us out, Gina, <laughs> who really put all this together. And Anna, Anna's gonna help close her out. Uh, we're running short, so I just cut a few slides out, but I'm going to, um, I promise this is going to be really quick. Um, all right, so um, I just want to say some thank yous to everyone, all of you. Um, oh. <laughs> um, we took these screenshots while you guys were all chatting, and it was so great to um, have conversations with you and to see everyone so engaged. Um, some things just to close the the arc. Uh, thinking back to yesterday when we heard Dan Wildcat speaking, uh, we're really trying to build authentic connections here. Uh, step back and listen, take responsibility, and be respectful of others. Uh, he really reminded us to contain or continue to be optimistic, um, and that we need to be thinking generationally that we're making the world better for the next generation. Um, uh, calling people in rather than calling them out, um, making these, as you just said, um, these groups are not closed. We continue to call people in and break down those silos. Um, we yeah, need to connect more with the workforce folks, need to connect more with policy, that type of thing, and reach beyond the choir um, and not duplicate efforts. So that's those are kind of the takeaways. I, again, just wanted to show this really quickly. This is the clean network map that we created earlier this year. Um, Katie showed this yesterday. Um, we are really hoping that after this event, some of these dots are even more connected than they were before and that folks are really um, thickening this web and, and, um, and making all of these um, outer edges more connected. Um, I wanna quickly just say, 
we just covered a lot of action items in the share out. There's a lot of ways that um, you can continue supporting clean in our work. Um, just as a, you know, as a professional, join our clean network listserv if you haven't already. Come to the calls. I know we are so limited with capacity, so we're always grateful for whoever can join us. Um, reach out to me about doing a presentation if you want to um, make more connections and highlight your work. Um, we have this really fantastic clean calendar on our homepage that we've created. You can always submit an event, um, attend a clean webinar, sign up for our newsletter. We just uh, revamped our newsletter to be focused on teachers and then also focused on the network. So we have two newsletters, an educator newsletter and a network newsletter that is specifically dedicated to folks in the network who are hosting professional development and who are doing this work, going to the conferences, that type of thing. Um, join us at AGU. We have um, multiple uh, climate empowerment sessions happening. So they're all um, searchable with the term climate empowerment. They're all in the title. So join us at AGU um, and connect your, your educator audience with our clean resource portal. We um, are constantly trying to make that portal uh, of resources my, more diverse. Um, so just thanks again to our, our plenary speakers. They're not with us anymore, but I just wanted to say uh, thank you to Dan and Leanne, our Ignite Talk speakers who yesterday um, did absolutely amazing. Um, all of our breakout room volunteers that I was frantically emailing at different points in the day saying, hey, can you do this? Hey, can you do this? As um, plans were changing and plans were evolving, I really appreciate everyone just kind of um, going with the flow there. Um, these people, I want to say all of them by name, Haley Krim, Jessica Bean, Katie Boyd, Kelly Lee, Lindsay Kirkland, Tamara Ledley, Anna Gold, Bart Mayer, Billy Spitzer, Dan Wildcott, Deb Morrison, Don Haas, and Frankie Nippold. These folks have all been working. Um, we meet every single Thursday. Uh, we have been meeting for the past six months every single Thursday. And they have done a fantastic job um, of pulling this together. And I just want to thank every one of them by name. Um, for, for their support. Um, these folks in particular led sessions over the past two days. Um, thank you for using your voice and um, leading us in, in these complex conversations. Um, it, it would not have been possible without you. Um, Bart in particular and Frank uh, have been working so hard on that matrix um, along with Haley. Um, Haley has spoken up a few times during this conference, but um, she has she is our total tech master, uh, Zoom wizard, and we um, I'm just so grateful to her for making all of our Zoom transitions smooth and being here the entire time um, and, and being so attentive to everyone's tech needs. Katie. Uh, thank you for uh, leading us and um, being our MC of sorts. Um, I really really appreciate it. Katie's the best colleague. Um, please remember to take our post-event survey. Um, this is our pilot year. As I said, this is the pilot year, so we're still learning. We're still evolving. Um, please share ways that you, things that you liked that we did. We would love to hear you share things that, things that you liked, um, and maybe some things that you think could improve. Um, this link is available on the roadmap, and it just went out in an email to all participants, so please take that. Um, our email, clean at colorado.edu if you want to follow up, um, but don't want to rush. It's Friday evening though, so you all deserve a break. Um, and I just, yeah, thank you all so much for being here. Um, we will continue to keep having these conversations and I promise there's, there's much more to come. And thank you, Gina. You did so yeah. much work on this. Yeah, good job. <laughs> Thanks everybody. everyone. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Have a great weekend. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jane. Gina, get some rest. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there's a. <laughs> One more quick question. Leon, I'm just reading your chat. You can find the link to the connections web. Um, we haven't 
publish that, Katie, we we don't have a public version of the um the web yet, right? It just it has it's part of a study, so it has right. We're still working on it. Um I, yeah. Um it's in the slides. So the picture itself you can grab from the slides. Um and it's an image right now, um, but we're working on it. And I, I, I kind of want to clean it up before I share it more widely. We're um, getting, a, we're doing analysis still, and we're trying to write a paper. And I'm going to present it on a clean call this fall. And Anna's going to present about it at AGU. So, like in the next like two months, it'll be a little bit more finalized. We're just trying to figure out exactly how we're going to look at it. So that was all organizations, and we have it based on each topic as well. And I want to get um, um, Casey or Emily or somebody to make it um, so that we have, because you saw we had the one with the organization names, but I want the anonymized version with the numbers with all the constellations showing, because I actually really love that it has all the constellations and the network analysis people are like, we got to get rid of those, you know? Um, and, and so the one I showed, I actually want it to have all the constellations. So I want to get a new image before I start sharing it more widely. So Leon, please feel free to grab it from the slides, um, but know that I'm hopefully going to like get a more finalized version of that and share it more widely in, in about mm, two months. Cool. In thanks. the next. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to hear a bit more on how, I mean, maybe offline, how the process and how it got made and stuff. So I don't know if that's of interest to other folks, but yeah, Leon, definitely. the paper, the paper that we're writing, I think will cover all the mechanisms and process and, and, um, and the, but there's a lot of other pieces in there that we're still trying to steep. Um, yeah. well, actually, well, 